This is one of the most popular topics that we cover um, for our semifinalists every season. And we're extremely grateful to the team at Lurie LLP for now, I believe, um, hosting this and presenting this to all of you for the fifth year in a row. Um, they're also one of our, our longest running sponsors. So um, we really could not do the work that we do and support all of you um, as, as Men Cup semifinalists without Lurie's support. And so um, both from, from their subject matter expertise and their financial support, it's we're really grateful. So. Um, I am not going to be presenting this because uh, financial stuff is sure not my wheelhouse. So I'm happy to hand it over to Kevin Besikoff, um, a partner at Lurie, um, and he will kick off the session and, and take it from here. Um, here you go, Kevin, thank you. Well, good morning and thanks for joining us. I was uh, scrolling through the participant list and um, I'm just thrilled to see how many people have now been with us on um, all of the Men Cup presentations that have that have happened so far this year. Um, really, just a tremendous class of, of Men Cup applicants, and, um, and and we're just always really excited to be participating in, in the Minnesota Cup. Um, as Jessica said, we are. We are a founding, uh, founding sponsor of Minnesota Cup. We are a CPA firm, um, and that uh, leads to our, our specialty related to um, this topic. So a little bit about myself. I'm Kevin Basikoff. I'm a partner at Lurie. I, um, in our, I'm in our entrepreneurial services group, which really means we work with companies every, everywhere from startup, getting founded, setting up uh, their company structure and their books to on the back end valuing the company and working through a transaction and every tax and accounting um, need in between. Uh, you know, just a little bit about Lurie, you know, we have all the services you'd expect to find in a CPA firm and they're all listed here and um, we can all read what they are. That's what we do. Who we are is different. We, you know, we, we were founded by entrepreneurs 80 years ago. Um, and those entrepreneurs instilled in the firm a spirit to support the entrepreneurial community, uh, grow with clients, uh, be great advisors, and work with people who, you know, are, are, at all stages, whether that's um, you know big companies that that need sophisticated services or or startup companies that just need to get started off on the right foot, um, that's really how how we were founded. It's the values that we live to, and it's why we love startups. And when we look to um, what is the economic engine of Minnesota. Um, while there are, you know, wonderful Fortune 500 companies here, um, the lifeblood of our economy and what continues to plant new green grass in our communities uh, of, of economic revitalization is the entrepreneurs in this community. Um, we, we see it of, from companies that have come out of of the big companies. Uh, we see it from people who've come out of our wonderful universities. Um, and uh, we've seen them grow to the Fortune 500 companies that are here. Um, so that's just a little bit about us. We, we, we live and breathe entrepreneurs. We believe that entrepreneurship is wonderful for our community. It's wonderful for um, economic equality. It's everything that uh, the Minnesota Cup sought, sought to establish when this contest uh, was established is, is, is coming true m many years later. So we are just thrilled to be involved. Um, Presenting with me today is my partner, Nate Schubert. He's in our in our tax group and Amy Jongarius, who is in our Your Books Accounting Outsourcing practice. And they will do a more formal introduction of themselves when we get there. 
Um, a little bit about the agenda. Uh, this is an intimidating topic for a lot of entrepreneurs and we understand that. Um, so that's why we, when we put this together and I can't believe it's been five years, um, we put this together in a way that helps people, you know, process through how to get started, really talking through the language of financial modeling prior to actually like going into the details of how uh, a forecast is actually put together so that you can sort of verbalize how it um, is put together. And then to go into some of the fundamentals of what does a forecast look like, how to prepare that and show a tool that we have. Um, and then we always leave plenty of time for all of your questions. So, um, so Minnesota Cup and most business plans really start with the written word or uh, in the case of Minnesota Cup, uh, a video uh, presentation of the, uh, of, of the business idea. That's all incorporated into your business plan. So it incorporates all the things that we've talked about so far in our previous presentations. You know, what is your mission? What is your vision? What values do you have? What are you doing for your marketing, your operations, uh, even touching on the finances and your team, uh, your intellectual capital, really kind of laying out uh, in words and videos, everything that you want to do. The next step once that's sort of laid out is putting it into numbers so that an investor can look at your idea and 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 do another check on the business plan say i love the idea now let's see what the potential of that idea is that translates into the financial plan and it it it's it's a bit of an iterative process because the two do work together quite uh quite a bit but when they are done well, you have a business plan that one outlines your ideas and people can read it and see the, see the potential of the idea. And then the financial plan puts those, that potential into a scenario that, that models to um, a judge or an investor or a bank or your other, any of your other constituents, what that business plan can do. To, to deliver your idea. Um, today, we're going to focus on that financial plan, whereas some of the previous t topics that we've done have talked about the business plan. Um, when we get into financial modeling, you know, there is a piece of it that is obviously competition specific, but we hope, um, that when you when you walk away from this presentation, you understand that it's not solely about the competition. There are um, huge benefits in doing this for yourself. Um, uh, one is just evaluating and testing that business model. You know, um, making sure that uh, if you if you if you project that you're spending. X million dollars on marketing that you're getting a return on that. Um, if you're evaluating your business model and you believe a uh, wholesale model may be a good model, you know, evaluating what if we switch to a direct to a consumer model, um, what would that look like? If you are out in the market raising capital, you would definitely be putting together some type of model that one demonstrates to the investor what the capabilities are of the company, but two also for you um, putting together a model that shows how much you need to raise to get to the next round so that you don't one, one run out of money or two don't raise uh, enough or raise too much so that you're not giving away more equity or less equity than you need. Um, and then the last one is different organizations like the WBDC or um, uh, 
for they're a great example of one certification may request a financial model to evaluate your idea um, provide you a certification to do business in a particular type of industry or or with certain credentials but in order for them to invest the time they want to make sure that it's worth investing the time so the financial model would be a big piece of what they're doing and evaluating is it worth their time to devote uh, the time to this now i'm going to turn it over to amy jungarius thanks kevin hello my name is amy jungarius I'm a manager in Lurie's outsourced accounting practice, which we call Your Books. Our team provides outsourced accounting, payroll, and financial reporting and CFO consulting services. Um, in addition, we get the honor and the privilege to work with entrepreneurs and business owners on a daily basis. And I specifically um, have the privilege of managing our clients within our healthcare and family office industry segments. Um, I'm excited to be with all of you today as I've been involved with the Minnesota Cup for a number of years through Lurie's sponsorship of the competition and this time of the year is so exciting as we get to see all the amazing um, um, contestants move from the you know obviously submitting your initial application to the semifinals so wishing all of you the best of luck as you um, continue on your journey. So let's cover some of just in general, the common mistakes in financial plans as we wanna really make sure that we help set you guys up for success as we cover really just understanding the financial plan piece of what you need to put together for your business. So there's two common mistakes. The first one is really the no girls, no profit forecast. And when I think about this, I think the question comes to mind is what's the point in being in business if you don't expect to ever make a profit? So let's stop digging a hole as this picture kind of entails and step back and think about what variables are driving you to a no growth, no profit forecast. Um, do you, for example, do you understand the market capacity for your product or service? Do you need to think about making a price or uh, making a price change or just evaluating your pricing as a whole? Are you overspending your marketing budget that you initially had thought about because of the demand for your product or just entering into a new market? So there's so many questions that come into play and I think it's just a matter of stepping back and really understanding your business and what's driving you to not have, a, you know, not to show any growth or profit in your forecast. The next common mistake that can happen in your, in putting a financial plan together is the wonderful hockey stick here. And in this, obviously this, the term hockey stick refers to the shape of this chart, the revenue growth line um, while it's really commendable to be optimistic and excited about the potential demand for your good or service, it's rare for business to experience dramatic levels of growth within a single 12 month period. So as you can see, the forecast shows a flat earnings up to a point and then exponential growth from that point on. So unless you have large volume of sales already contracted in the pipeline at the time preparing your budget, I would really advise you to step back and think of a more modest ramp up of revenue growth. Um, because we really want to be mindful in what you're anticipating your revenue will be for uh, your business as you, you know, take the written word as Kevin talked about and really translate it, translate it into the financial component of your business. So really the interesting thing is to really try to avoid both of these common mistakes is I think just going back to the basics of like, do you understand the market demand for your product? And do you know what the capacity is for it? And really trying to figure out how can I predict sales that's as um, realistic as it possibly can be. So continue to think about the potential company or the market shifts and the impact on your sales. And you know, are you in a seasonal or cyclical cycle for your business or your product or your you know for your service? So it's really thinking about your business and really being as realistic as you possibly can be about the growth of your about the growth and trajectory that you have for your organization. Um, next slide, thank you. So how, how do you even get started, right? I mean, I think that's the biggest, um, you know, the scariest factor of this, right? Like financials aren't everybody's expertise. So how do I even get started in putting a financial plan together and finding some comfort in taking what's written? Cause that's easy for all of us to do, but how do we take the written and translate it into um, really the financial component. So translation, right? The goal of a financial plan is to translate your story to numbers. And the most important reason to compile this financial plan is to your own benefit. 
So you understand really how well you're taking the financial plan that you've created and really looking at actual, because at the end of the day, you know, as you put a plan together, that's an estimate of what you think your business will do. And if you can compare it to, back to actual, you can actually see the pros and cons of how well you put your plan together versus what's actually happening on a day-to-day -day basis as you run and grow your business. Formatting of the plan. The format of the plan isn't really all that critical. There are certain elements around the format, um, but really getting into it a document that you can um, easily change or make different versions of. Um, and then assumptions, you know, obviously at this point, you're making a number of assumptions about what is the growth, what are the expenses I'll incur. And so with that, um, you know, assumptions are really best guess, but there's other resources you can use to find industry standards or find other assumptions. And my colleague, Nate, will go into more detail of the assumptions piece in a few minutes. So if we talk about format of the plan, the layout can be extremely flexible and that's probably the best approach to having a really successful plan is it's adaptable and flexible. So when we're building a plan, we wanna make sure that you have the ability to test the process as, as test the process. So you want the plan to be in a format that's super flexible and adaptable. So Excel's a great resource. So Microsoft or Google Sheets, whatever is your preferred method, but Creating it in Excel, you can you know, build formulas and make some um, associations with it to other tabs, right? So anything that you can do to make it as adaptable and flexible in, in a format. So Excel is definitely a preferred method. If you wanna use some other softwares or other um, applications that are out there, you can. But I think at the end of the day, it's trying to make it as easy as possible for you to navigate and put, again, your written plan into numbers. Um, and so, in addition to that, if you use Excel, there's options for creating what if scenarios. So uh, basically you're, you, know, you can use what if scenarios and then you know, make different variations of that financial plan. So if you wanna create different versions based off assumptions that you have in a play, or if you end up getting, uh, you know, contracting, contracting with a new distributor to sell your product, or you have a new contract, I mean, you can make different variations of that financial plan to have in your back pocket so that you can show a specific investor or present on it. And then it just allows you to see, you know, what happens if you make this change and how does that flow through your financial plan and how does it impact your bottom line if you, you know, bring in a, like a marketing specialist to help market your product. And, you know, you wanna see, you know, if we put a $50,000 budget together for the year, how does that impact my bottom line? How does that impact my, you know, plan overall for the year when it comes to, you know, educating investors on, you know, we're going to invest in marketing and this is what's going to happen over the next five years because of the results of marketing, we're going to have increased revenue or, you know, or we're, we'll reduce expenses in other areas because of that specific investment. Um, in addition, within your financial plan, you can have ratios. So you can incorporate a variety of ratios. For example, you can analyze a percentage of increase in year over year sales, or you can continue to monitor your gross profit margin in that same document. And again, my colleague, Nate, will go into more details regarding that in the financial model that he'll walk through in a few minutes. Statements, uh, this is really talking about uh, the standard statements that every organization business has. And that's talking about a balance sheet, an income statement, and a cash flow. These three, three statements are really connected and integrated with one another. And basically they'll help also in support of your financial plan. Because, um, for example, if you're planning to purchase some, you know, equipment, you'll have, need to make sure that that purchase of that equipment is sitting on your balance sheet as a fixed asset. And depending on if you purchase that fixed asset with cash or you take out a loan, that'll impact your balance sheet as well. But on the other side of it, it'll definitely impact your P&L because now you'll have monthly depreciation expense that needs to get you recorded and reflect on your, on your profit and loss statement. In addition, there's a component of that transaction that impacts your overall cash flow. So what's the change in your cash position from a period to period perspective? So again, having an understanding of your statements, the balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flow also kind of correlate into this financial plan as well. In regards to a time frame, um, you know, your cash flow projection, we we it can vary from the time period. It could be a month to month basis or from a one to five year period. I think it's depending on your organization and what your investors are asking for, what, you know, what are, and also what you're going to out to market for. Maybe 
you're you're going to the Minnesota Cup and they're asking for a one to five year, right? Or you're going to some other investors and they're looking for a month to month perspective. Um, I think it just depends. And I think, again, if you work in Excel, you can set up different variations of what that financial plan looks like. And then you can have that already prepared. And again, with Excel, you can easily change those formulas or structure to make sure that it's adaptable for whatever the end user is of that financial plan. Um, so keep in mind, again, the uh, uh, potential investor will evaluate your business based on both the qualitative aspects of what you put together and the quantitative aspects. So in other words, the format matters as much as the numbers, you know, proper formatting, complete statements, proper labeling are, are all part of the demonstration of your financial acumen and the overall presentation of your financial plan. Um, so the financial plan that we'll present to you in the next segment of the presentation is a complete financial projection and it is a great template to leverage. So um, I will now pass off the presentation to Nate Schubert, a partner in our tax services group. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as Amy mentioned, I'm a partner in our tax services. My role is uh, really to uh, manage client relationships, um, provide consulting and planning uh, for tax saving oppor savings opportunities, um, and that's for both businesses as well as high net worth individuals. Um, additionally, there's other business consulting uh, along the way. Um, I really have a passion for coming up with new ideas, uncovering opportunities for our clients, and the um, really the joy that I get, uh, you know, with startups and, and early stage companies working with them is, is I think there's a certain level of excitement um, because of the unknown uh, of kind of what could be and, and what can happen along the way. Uh, this is my second year of being a judge uh, with Minnesota Cup. I'm in the high tech division. And I'm also an expert network um, in the expert network with Lunar Startups. So what we're going to talk about now is really kind of the nitty gritty, if you will. Um, you know, we got the theory, and now at this point in time, kind of Excel becomes your best friend, if, if you will. Uh, Justin, you want to go to the next slide? Thanks. So as, as Amy touched on with these assumptions, um, you know, th this is where we're really kind of going through the details with it. So, um, you know, are they realistic? So is this something that um, if you kind of take a look at it, kind of ask, this, ask yourself the question, is this something that uh, seems too difficult to achieve? Or maybe it's maybe ask the question, is this seem too easy to achieve? Obviously you want to find a, the a kind of in, the, in between that of something you're targeting and you have goals for at the same time, maybe one, at one spectrum or the other uh, isn't then realistic, right? You should be maybe more in between. Um, you know, the hockey stick growth, I saw a couple of comments on that. Uh, yes, it's obviously what investors want to see. The question is what you are um, putting together and providing, is it realistic? You know, what, what are those assumptions that you documented um, with that? Um, you know, everyone's trying to predict the future here um, and uh, not everyone's gonna agree with these assumptions that you use. So, you know, th this is where the documentation comes into play and the research. Um, you know, go to the library, use RMA, Standard & Poor's, you know, SMP, um, look at kind of what's out there, what other benchmarks are there, and document why you think um, you can get to this point uh, for the four-year assumptions on, on the, the growth or the cost, you know, whatever it might be. And then once you have those, now you got to test them. So this is, um, you know, taking a look at the model. Um, what happens if you change this, right? What if you don't hit your sales that you think you're going to hit in year two, for example? Or um, what, what about if you don't, um, you aren't able to hire the, the number of employees or contractors that you need? How does that change uh, what happens? Or maybe it's, you know, you're targeting a, a investment or funding, you know, at the end of year two. Um, what happens if you don't get, you know, all of it? Is that going to change something along the path? And just to give you some idea of kind of what's going to happen, and one thing that actually kind of is helpful, taking a step back on this is look, you know, pictures, um, maybe get, get a graph together, things like that to help you kind of see the trends and what's happening. And then um, lastly with these assumptions is, you know, it's all related. Um, everyone's on a different spectrum of understanding financials, but um, something that impacts the income statement is gonna impact the balance sheet. And it might impact cash or it might not impact cash, but understanding kind of the, how, how it works and, and with one another in the play um, and to help you understand, because at the end of the day, cash is king. And so working through the full model with and cash flows is where everything is going to come into together. Uh, Justin, can you go to that? Thanks. 
so you know understanding that these are going to come all to together here um you know as you have revenue it's not to say you're immediately going to get cash so you got to understand that there's you know depending on the type of business that you're in you might have lag time on ar before you collect that um, if you're on a SaaS model maybe you're going to get paid up front so your cash is going to come in but you can't really use that cash right away because you have the cost of sales it's going to you know be x amount of that to pay for salaries or whatever else you have going on uh, to cover those costs um, costs get sold in inventory so what you know inventory to acquire it right you're going to have accounts payable how long is it before we're going to pay off the accounts payable um, and then at that point it converts to you know cost gets sold when you sell it on the income statement and so as you kind of work through these and again depending on where you're where you're at on the spectrum of, of financial understanding um, you'll see kind of the the ebbs and flows of how everything works together um, and, and we will have a model to walk through uh, with you to kind of see how this all comes together um, you know operating expenses you, you got to ensure that as your sales increase you know, other costs will probably go up too not just costs get sold um, so you have to make sure you're thinking about all those other things and it's not just all to the bottom line just because sales grow up uh, your costs should, are expected to go up as well uh, if you're manufacturing products are you going to pay them salary or are you gonna pay them hourly what happens if you don't aren't able to hire employees are you gonna have to pay overtime to ensure that you're hitting the, the be able to hit the sales that you are expecting to hit obviously that's going to uh, impact your, your bottom line if you have to pay overtime um, thinking about a uh, sales team with uh, paying commissions so if sales are going up well their commissions would go up and so ensuring that you're kind of factoring these things into play um, and, and including it as part of your assumptions so that uh, if, if things change later you learn something else later along the road you're able to update the, the model accordingly um, thinking of maybe more the tech, tech side of things development costs uh, usually, obviously, more upfront costs with that, but if you're, you know, paying for for this, uh, contractors or whatnot, uh, who's who's bearing the risk of of development? Are you going to, uh, is it a set contract or is it hourly? So that obviously will impact also uh, your model. And then kind of the details with uh, the specific items. So for revenue, you know, tracking maybe how many units you're going to sell, what's the price, are you going to offer any discounts? What about shipping and handling? Uh, again, the more uh, detail you can kind of put in these assumptions, the more um, you, you'll be able to truly get to, to a number that makes sense in how you got there and help support it. You know, costs get sold, same thing. What's labor costs, cost per unit? Um, when you think of AR, you know, what do, do you need to have a bad debt reserve factored in that you might not collect everything uh, that you sell? Uh, you got to factor that in there too. Um, with inventory and accounts payable, thinking of things like lead time and how long is it going to take to get our product if you're not manufacturing it here so that you ensure you have enough products to be able to sell, right? Because it's just because you say you're, you're going to make it this month, doesn't right? How much are you going to actually have to be able to sell it there? Um, Justin, you want to go to the next uh, slide? Thanks. So we'll go over a few different um, ratios that um, are helpful in kind of putting together the model really coming down to kind of cash looking at cash flow and so uh, ultimately here accounts receivable turnover so this is you know how many times per year are you collecting your inventory um, and then bringing it down to how many days uh, before you collect that inventory so for example if if, if the cash, you know so it's revenue divided by what your accounts receivable is if if your answer is six that means you're you're collecting your ar six times a year or every two months is when you is when you collect that inventory and in our model that we'll get into we'll show you how that kind of comes into play with help forecasting cash flows um, uh, for that uh, justin can you go to the next slide thanks um, inventory turnover you know same same concept here how, how how many how many times a year are you selling all of your inventory and then getting into how many days so how, what's your lead time how much you need to have in hand things like that to think about um, these uh these ratios will will come in handy to factor that in there and then uh, lastly is the, the payable so as you acquire inventory how long is it before you expect to uh next thanks justin um how often are you going to be you know how soon are you going to pay off so if you're expecting to have a 30-day you know uh paying off the, the ap well what about 
you know, if AR you're collecting it there every 60 days, there's obviously a leg there on cash flow. Your cash is, is leaving 30 days before you, you collect. Um, and again, looking at uh, doing research here, uh, benchmarking with again, S&P and RMA um, will be helpful with, with looking at maybe what ratios make sense uh, for these types of things. So next, I think we're gonna show um, a template that we'll share afterwards on a uh, forecast here model. So what you have in front of you here is uh, the income statement. So looking at this, this is you know high level. Um, e each type of business is gonna have its own unique uh, items. Um, obviously you can get much more granular on listing out more specific types of expenses, or maybe you have multiple revenue sources. You might wanna list those out. This is kind of just as, as a starting point uh, to help out things. And um, you know, working through here of kind of what the expectation is, is on your, your net income um, through that. And from here, if you wanna to go to the balance sheet, Justin. Yep, or sorry, yep, down below, my bad. Um, here's some of those assumptions I talked about. So um, looking at percentages of, of what your, your growth is gonna be on sales versus your margins, uh, what percent of, of, of sales is gonna be your, your selling and, and general administrative costs. Um, working through those items to, uh, you know, again, testing and, and retesting those numbers of how, how that impacts you. Uh, here's an example of a balance sheet, um, looking at obviously the, ca you know, cash, uh, the receivables, any fixed assets. So again, you're going to pay for fixed assets. Great. Well, it hits the balance sheet. So tr tracking that there's, there is another side to it besides just the income statement. Um, debt, if you're going to be taking on any debt, whether it's, you know, credit card debt to accounts payable uh, to, to bank debt. And then um, down below, uh, again, we have those, you know, assumptions on some, some ratios that you can um, plug in numbers to. The, the blue cells are kind of input cells. What's your day's inventory? What's your, your day's outstanding on your, on your, your AR, your sales there? Uh, things like that. And then lastly, the cash flow. Uh, again, ca cash is king. So looking at this, We'd like to see black here. Red is not a good good thing, um, as much as some people might think with comes to tax, not paying taxes. But uh, you know, we want to see what's happening here. Um, our net income is in this example twenty two thousand year one, but you know we got we we have uh, an increase in AR, which means we didn't collect AR of eighty two hundred dollars. We, we had to pay for seven thousand dollars worth of inventories. So there's adjustments that come into play with looking at what your your bottom line cash flow is in, in a given year. And again, tying everything together here um, and, and testing the models. And you might have a couple versions of best case, worst case, realistic, just for your own purposes of kind of what's happening. Um, it'll all be, uh, uh, you know, helpful to kind of work through it. And then I think the last thing here is maybe taking a step back and saying, okay, we have our business plan. Here's our financial model. Does it make sense? Do they talk to one another? Is there something that I mentioned in my business plan that is not even mentioned here? Um, maybe you had a pivot and that's part of it. You, you, you're, you know, after you did the business plan, but uh, that, that's important um, to, to have those uh, related to one another. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Jessica, you wanna take over for the Q and A? Yeah. Thank you all so much. That was awesome. So um, I've been seeing a few questions come in through the chat. And so um, we would love to have you um, actually, it, and maybe if you want to, Justin, if you'd want to unshare your screen and then we can see everyone's faces in case you would like to turn your cameras on and ask any questions um, and unmute yourselves, so we can make this as personable as possible. Um, certainly feel free to keep using the chat and I'll try to monitor it, but um, does anybody want to go first? Otherwise, I have some of my own questions I can totally tee up. Andy. I have like a quick one. Yeah. Well, just, you know, in terms of putting together the business model or the business uh, model, the case, the 10 page document, you don't have a lot of room to stuff a spreadsheet into it and make it look good. Do you have uh, suggestions or maybe an example to show that? Because I'm, I am stuffing a spreadsheet in here and it's not pretty and it, it kind of takes a whole page and just want to kind of get some thoughts on that. 
It's a super good question. Nate, do you want to take that? I mean, I, or, or even Kevin, like any of you who have reviewed those business plans a number of times, otherwise I can, I can try it too. Well, the, there is attachments, I believe, uh, that can, can be submitted there. Um, you know, as far as like the details go, um, you can obviously consolidate a lot of that information. Mm -hmm. And I would really just highlight the items that are important that, ma that make the most sense. Uh, clearly, again, every business is going to have something a little bit different. But um, with the, your business plan, what, what do you really need to highlight that you've taken into account that you expect this to happen? Yeah. Yeah, you could, you could highlight some of the KPIs or, or revenue growth, mm -hmm. um, financing needs, um, return on advertising, if that's a piece of your business. Um, and, and then, Jessica, you can put the projection in an attachment, correct? Yes, if you want to include it as an appendix, um, you can absolutely, and sometimes people choose to do that because it's easier to read an Excel sheet in, um, what is the word, in like a horizontal layout? Landscape like, versus portrait. portrait. Landscape, thank you, there we go. Um, some people choose to just do that and include it at the end of the PDF so that it's it, you don't have to cram it or make it so small and unreadable. Um, but to, to Nate and Nate's point, um, it is like the business plan is this like written primarily text story. So yeah, choosing choosing the section that you think is the either the most relevant, the most important for the judges to see in that section. Um, I would yeah, then you can have a a smaller, more manageable table to insert in there, and then just yeah include the the full detail um, as an appendix. Thank you for that question, Andy. I'm sure a lot of other people were wondering too. And it's probably by judge by judge basis, right? Like some people probably want to read more versus look at the numbers. But at the end of the day, like, I feel like Nate and Kevin would probably jump to the numbers first just because of, mm -hmm. you know, their expertise. But there's probably a bunch of, you know, number of judges who like to read. But at the end of the day, again, this is to your benefit to have both kind of mirror each other because you can leverage all your hard work that you're doing right now, right? For any other investor that comes to the table at a late important, later point in time and you've already have the documents prepared. Exactly. Um, um, can I, can I jump in on one of the questions that was in the chat? Please. Um, there was a couple of, some back and forth on the hockey stick projection. Um, and I think the, me the message is, is not that there's anything wrong with a hockey stick. What's wrong with a hockey stick is that sometimes there's a hockey stick with nothing behind it. So if you take, for example, a, a SaaS company, so a software as a service company, they, they have hockey stick projections because they're constantly adding monthly new revenue. And it builds on top of each other until they get to a sort of a critical mass of how much their monthly recurring revenue they want to have. But underneath that assumption is uh, of the of the recurring revenue is a, a couple of other assumptions that build into supporting a hockey stick. You know, one, they're investing tremendously uh, in continuous development of a product, so people. Um, they have a ton of advertising. They uh, typically get paid in advance, so they have um, they have a revenue versus cash flow timing difference, and um, and they typically raise a bunch of money so that it, they're able to do the hockey stick. So it's not that there's something wrong with the hockey stick; it just has to be supported by the business model, and it has to be supported by how much you're reinvesting into the business and how much capital you believe it takes to, to get there. And like this tool that, that Nate showed um, allows all those things to be modeled in so that, um, you know, as, as Nate said, if, you, if, you, if you're a SaaS company and you're forecasting this hockey stick growth and you see your cash is red, you go, oh, bad answer we better change something to be able to have enough money to not go out of not grow ourselves out of business i have my hand raised may i ask a question please lena go ahead uh thank you um what do you think about an income strategy that says 
I, I'm in an idle kind of zero operating mode based on personal capital until I raise one sale. It's enough of an expensive item that will put me into business. And so that's my, my strategy is to grow the business from sales and simply project the sales of, of this expensive product and uh, use that as my business strategy. Uh, have you seen that done? I haven't, but um, I would expect then year one is assuming you get that first sale because there's be no activity up until that point anyway. Correct, what, thank what you. We, what we, yeah, what we would see is sales driving cash flow, not investors or you know debt. Thanks. And yeah. obviously the written document right. uh, lines that here's your plan, right? In case, for example, like a Nate and Kevin would go right to the projection and be like, you know, what's, what's the situation here? Then they could go back to the written document to be like, okay, I get it. Like, here's the business strategy mm -hmm. around why there's no revenue. And then, and, you know, once this item gets sold, there's enough money or cash flow to pay for everything else. Yeah. And if you realistically think it's going to take two years before that first sale, you know, you should document that then. Yeah. Um, Great. I think that that comes in, that comes up often with really capital intensive or manufactured products or anything that has to go through a regulatory process that it can often be years and years and years of, of expense and, um, you know, work and often, which is, requires investment before um, there's any sales or revenue. Um, so that's, I, I, depending on the type of company you have in the type of business, that's not necessarily the wrong <laughs> way to do it. Um, but yeah, it does require like eyes wide open, having a good sense of how much money will need to go into it. And it, will you be able to actually achieve that, um, make those investments in some fashion to get you to that for sale. So as long, yeah, as long as you're transparent and really clear about that, um, it shouldn't be like a ding against you. Um, uh, Kristen, do you want to go next with your question? Sure. Thank you. Um, so I was hoping to get a little advice on um, the financial projections when it comes to impact ventures. Um, so right now we have a spreadsheet that is built flexible so we can kind of tweak things around and see, okay, if we put more energy into this, how does that help help the business? But obviously as an impact venture, our goals are not just profit, but as we make more money, like we figure out what works first and then we use that knowledge to put more energies into that so we can be saving money so we can put it back into the business to be expanding and growing. So um, I guess I'm just wondering, like, and we also have, you know, we provide services, but then we also sell goods. So we have some things, different parts of the business we can rely on within the same um, ecosystem. Um, but do you guys have any advice on um, whether we should be tweaking how we're doing that and also um, how to make our case um, since our, our dollar isn't, um, obviously we wanna make money so we can feed it back into the business, but our, our main goal is to make change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I feel bad we didn't touch on that uh, earlier because we usually, I usually actually address that in leading up to this and that the purpose of the, the forecast isn't always to maximize profit. Um, and if the if the project if the purpose of the business and the purpose of the projection is to maximize impact, then it's um, demonstrating and highlighting the impact that you're having. Um, for sure. And to the oh, go ahead. To it, so that you're you know you're really demonstrating you know how you're you're generating the cash that that then can go towards your impact and what right. impact that is. It's not uh, it, it's not to say that a, a social driven social mission driven company that breaks even uh, isn't a bad thing. It's 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 taking the profits that you you would have otherwise otherwise had and directing them to the mission and highlighting that. So, Kevin, would you say that like you know, in the written piece, maybe it's the Kate or maybe somewhere in the financial plan, it's more KPIs around like non-financial impact, right? That could be a great way to also illustrate just what they, you know, what the purpose of the business is and what they're actually doing from a non-financial piece that's impacting the community or mm -hmm. whatever the outcome is. Absolutely. Is there a way to, for me to make my case 
to prove to people like you guys that like on the spreadsheet that these are, this is the other value besides just the dollar amount? Like how, how do you squeeze that into a spreadsheet? That's I think the correlation between the business plan and the mm -hmm. financial model. The business okay. plan, you're gonna say that, the, the non-financial piece of it. In the, in the financial model, you could put, you know, what percent of say profits you are putting towards impact stuff. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can see all of these line items would be actually where that, the dollars are going. And then the non-financial uh, impact though is in the business plan of here's really the benefits that are gonna be received from all that. Mm -hmm. right. Like we had X amount of sales and we were able to impact a hundred more people than we did last year, right? Like you could yeah. say mm -hmm. like from year over year, we had hundred thousand dollar change in revenue increase. So we took, you know, a portion of that and went to giving it to a certain group of people, which went and that number of people increased from 50 last year to a hundred because we had increase of revenue of a hundred grand, hundred grand, right? You could do something like so that. How do you recommend it for, because our whole mission is upcycling. So literally everything we do is pulling things from landfills. So like every dollar we make goes towards that. It's not like we're just donating it. We're actually doing the work ourselves here. So I don't know mm -hmm. how, how I portray. I mean, I can sure. make a case for it in, in written word. Um, well, I, I would think you could, you, in something like that, you could probably estimate the amount of, you know, uh, item, estimate the pounds of items that are not going into a landfill. Okay, That's cool. Something, yeah. Or I had been metric like that. Yeah. I had been tracking how many garments I rescued and my phone died and it didn't push to the cloud. So I lost <laughs> all of the data for 2019. So we're going to start fresh. <laughs> Another option though, Kristen, is that if the revenue you're bringing in is fueling your labor or like the salaries or like the funding that goes towards the people that are doing work and sort of serving in that way like that's another quantifiable thing that you could you know show the correlation between the revenue coming in and the expense going out mm -hmm. that would still fit that story well cool. under job creation mm -hmm. absolutely okay. thank you other questions from folks and apologies if i'm missing one in the chat i'm going to glance at that quick there's there's a question in the chat about uh where it's going to take five to seven years to get going and should they submit a 10-year you know forecast um, in that case, I mean, if it's truly going to take that long to really see what the impact is going to be once you get going, you'd have to be able to show something a little bit longer so, to, so we see the impact from doing that, right, from developing the product or whatever it might be. Um, and yes, and that's outside of the request, I think it was five years maybe, but um, uh, th that would see the impact. You know, what, what is it going to take to get that point? Because you're either going to need to, your own personal, this is the tying in the whole thing, right, balance sheet. Is it coming from your personal equity? Is it coming from investors? Is it coming from debt? To yeah. get through those five to seven years yeah. to where you can get, you know. Yeah. So. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, this is Ramji. I was the one who asked the question, but, you know, a lot of the medical devices, especially the implantable, will, implantables take, you know, that long, uh, the PMA yeah. type devices. So it's not unusual. So I, it was more uh, curious in terms of, you know, specific to MN Cup, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, how was it presented? But yeah, that, that makes sense. So thanks for the answer. Yeah. And just want to echo that that is super common yeah. in the sense in health IT division. That's what they expect. You know, if you weren't showing that, then they'd be like, do you really yeah. know what it takes to get something like this to market? So you're, you're in a great spot. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Uh, yeah, don't fret about it. But um, it's yeah. a good question because that it's not true for everybody, but it does, it, it's very important and central to a couple yeah. different types of businesses models. Um, yeah. I see Lino raised his hand again. I'll, I'll come to you in a second, Lino. Um, Thank you. Notice I, you have a, oh, sorry, Lino, one second. I'm just going to, um, Kayla, Kayla Yang Best, do you want to ask a question quick? I think you may have sent a chat just to me in the chat. Yeah, I didn't know if you were monitoring that. It, no problem. Uh, my question was answered in the social mission driven question. So thanks. I do have a technical one, but I'll wait till the end. It's, it's not about forecasting and putting a budget together, it's a little bit more of the line item. Piece, so I'll just wait, but go ahead, Lionel. I'm um, thank you. Um, so as a, as a LLC, a corporation, um, does it, is it helpful to, um, sorry, I was struggling with technology for a moment, uh, to talk about the social value that as a corporation, we add to the macro economy, meaning the the national economy uh, in our projections, 
and then focus on the microeconomy like we're talking about in our financial statements? Or do you think that the macroeconomy, social value part of the equation is not good in this presentation? Thank you. If I made sense. It, um, I guess, is the idea, the plan that you have so large that executing the plan is going to change the economy i and in, in its plan i uh, i uh, yes in a way but not grandiose kind of stuff just in the mechanics of doing projections uh you know tweaking the mechanics it's a geographic yeah. growth uh pattern and and so uh you know it just grows geographically sure. And once you start a spot, then it grows horizontally in that area based on word of mouth. Sure. I would yeah. say if, if it has that level of impact, then that's that would be um, something to, to model in. Thank you. Um, or isn't it giving more just detail about the product as a whole, like the impact that it can have yeah. after one sale happens that it could just spread to your point geographically i mean that could be just a benefit from a bigger picture longevity mm -hmm. health of the organization if this sale actually does happen mm -hmm. awesome well i hope that helps there. thank you um what other questions do you all have we we maybe have time for one or two more depending on how how long they are, but um, definitely also know this isn't um, your last opportunity to chat with the Lurry team that we will be sharing that sign up for one on one conversation. So if something that you want to address is easier um, addressed in specific um, in, a, in a different session, that's great too. Jessica, this is Kayla uh, again. Yeah. So uh, maybe if there's no other question I can ask my more yeah, technical or financial terminology here and, and understanding. I've seen the um, category cost of goods and cost of inventory kind of used somewhat interchangeably and listed differently. Can you just help me understand a little bit? I think I do, but I just want to hear from some of the financial experts on what's the difference? Are they the same? Are they different? How would you, why both terms? Well, uh, Typically, cost of goods is the, the normal usage. If you have something that you're manufacturing, depending on how detailed you want to be, um, you know, are you buying a product and you want to track raw materials separately from maybe the labor that you're putting in to make it into what ultimately what widget you're going to sell? Um, but essentially, same thing otherwise. Kevin, so the, the material, you would categorize that cost in the cost of inventory if you're holding, let's say... Uh, I'm a manufacturer and I've got uh, 100 pounds of uh, coriander seeds, let's put it that way, in food manufacturing. That would be mm -hmm. the inventory cost, what it costs that and what I'm holding and how much I'm using of that versus the cost of goods is the labor that goes into processing that coriander into the food. Is that what? Um, um, or does, would or shouldn't everything. I worry about that at all? <laughs> It's kind of the, the flow of the cost accounting. So your inventory yeah. includes material, labor, and overhead. Um, and you sort of build up what is the cost of the material, labor, and overhead into your inventory cost. And then when you sell it, it goes from inventory into your cost of goods sold. So inventory is what you have available to sell uh, and cost of goods sold is what you've already sold. Uh, the it. inventory balance sheet. Yeah, cost gets old p &L, so Okay. Okay, I think that's the piece I'm missing to make the clear connection. All right, thank you. I have that another good question, question if I may. I, oh, go I think ahead. Anders had a oh, question second. too. Yeah, I was just gonna, I think Joe had his, oh, it, okay. I think Anders and Joe both have questions but they haven't spoken yet. So let's have them go next. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll go quick. So what about like big what if scenarios? So if you have like, a potential grant funding or something like that that would really change your financials like how should, should we represent those or just pick one scenario or yeah i mean is the grant what's your chances of getting the grant i guess maybe i'd go to that if you're one out of a thousand 
you know, applicants or are you like probably like you know, 50% at this point. So it's like, uh, could go either way. I mean, I, I think in that case, you would document that you think you're going to get it, but you're going to have backup that, you know, where you're at in the process on that. Um, you know, the judges will see that and you, you've documented that it's not a guaranteed thing. You're in the process. We think we have a really good shot. If we get it, here's what we think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if there's a specific purpose purpose for the grant too, because right. like maybe the grant is for one specific thing and that's what you'll use all that funding for would be probably good information too. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Joe, do you want to go next? Yeah. Uh, so there's sort of this tension between growth and profitability, right? Or if you're like running a small local business, you need profitability from day one, whereas a company like Amazon was not really profitable for like 10 plus years. Um, in the industry I'm in, like I, I'm more on the Amazon type of thing where I want to push all of our cash into growth for the foreseeable future. And I'm wondering from a Minnesota Cup judging perspective, how something like that gets viewed to do, or is it important that I'm forecasting like net profitability by year five or year X or something like that? That's a super good question. What do you think, um, Larry folks? Mm. Um, I, I think I've seen, you know, two scenarios, one being where somebody forecasts through a period of time where, you know, that accelerated growth sort of caps off and you then get to a cash flowing business, um, or, uh, an assumed exit, you know, typically companies that are growing like that have some assumed exit at some point in time, like the SaaS company that we talked about um, has some assumed exit at 10 to 11 times revenue, which is just astounding and, and um, makes the whole reinvestment and growth worthwhile. So I think it's either an assumed exit or, um, or some leveling off that explains why it made sense to ramp like that. Does that help Joe? Okay. I was just going to add on to that. It really does. I mean, I know they've, uh, the presenters have shared this a lot, but almost any scenario is good as long as it fits within the story you're telling about your goals, be they financial or growth or exit or, um, as long as the numbers match what you're articulating in the written portion, um, that it shouldn't be like a ding or it's not that Minnesota Cup expects or a good finalist candidate has these facts associated. It's all really specific to what you're all doing and, and the judges take that into consideration. So um, I hope that helps. And keep in mind, again, the template that we're providing is a template, right? Like this is for you guys to use to your benefit because you're the fortunate individuals who are on this call today and get the opportunity to have that template in your hands. So. The template is made for you to modify, adjust, do whatever you need to, right? We just gave you a basis and an example. So use it to your benefit. Research RMA, Risk Management Association, or S&P like Nate talked about. If you are unsure of assumptions, like use those resources to your benefit to understand what are other industry assumptions for different buckets of that template that will help you, you know, get some determination as to where you should be in regards to your business. You know, obviously it won't be exact because every business is a little different, but those are resources you guys can leverage to help build out that template and to give you um, comfort and assurance as to what you're putting together for assumptions and what your forecast looks like. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Natasha, did you have a question or I think you had your hand up for a little bit, but if you, if it was answered, we can. I did, but it's kind of complex. So maybe I'll reach out on the side. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, we want to, and we will be sharing um, you'll be getting an email from me very shortly that has the sign up for those one-on-one -on -one sessions. So please take advantage of them. It's really generous of Larry to offer that much time to all of you. So thank you again to Larry for this fantastic presentation and all your support. Um, that email will also include the template as an attachment. So you can go ham, um, play around with it, benefit from the fact that all of those um, relationships and the attachment are built for you. So you don't have to go take a crash course in Excel um, to make it yourself. So um, again, thank you all so much and good luck and look for that email from me. And then hopefully we'll see as many of you as we can at the social event on Friday. 
Um, if you haven't seen that uh, register, you can visit the Google site to sign up for that or reach out to Jamie or I with any questions. So again, thank you to Lori. Um, thank you all so much for being here and have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks guys. Bye. Thank Bye everyone.